I wanted to just uh, reintroduce myself, uh, guest preacher here. Uh, the elders don't know what they got themselves into, but my price is right. I'm cheap, and so they'll have me back. Um, it's great to be with you. I wanted at this time to uh, thank the elders for the last six weeks of rest and rejuvenation, time in prayer, His Word. Um, anyway, just a blessing. I want to thank the church, uh, thank our staff. Uh, all of our staff for uh, standing in the gap, and then also for Jeff, Mike, and Will. Let's give them a hand for doing a fantastic, fantastic job. Uh, also want to thank you as a church for uh, remembering me and especially my bride in your prayers. Uh, someone said, what do you do with six weeks off? Well, the first week you take care of grandkids. Uh, the second week you take care of a few speaking engagements in Texas and New Mexico. And the third week you watch your wife, uh, I think, picking up grandkids too much. Uh, her back just completely had in a direction it has never done before. She has back surgery this coming Tuesday. And so she is home. Hi, honey. She is watching online. I know where she is on that heating pad. And uh, thank you for your prayers for her. Uh, but, you know, you know, talk about God's wonderful timing. You know, uh, my back is out. I can't move. And here I am with a month on my hands going, I got nothing. <laughs> And so pray for her as her caregiver has been somewhat suspect in all of that. But uh, it, it has been a, a good, good time, and I am thrilled to be back. Uh, speaking of prayer, do not forget what Kevin announced earlier through our video. Uh, prayer night this coming Tuesday, 630 on health matters. Uh, if there is anything in your life that's a burden, if there's anything uh, that you could use some prayers for with your health, we're mindful the Word of God says. If anyone is sick, uh, let the elders of the church pray over them. That happens every prayer night. We'll also be praying for students and teachers. Uh, this coming Sunday, a week from today, we're going to be praying over our teachers in this assembly. And not just our teachers, public, private, homeschool, but everyone from our superintendent attendance to the, the crossing guards and all in between uh, our students and teachers as they go back. I'm especially mindful of our college kids today, many of them waking up for the first time, those freshmen, and uh, getting up on their own and headed off to a new church. And as I think about college kids, my dad, uh, one of the fascinating stories that he would always uh, share with me was the interesting people he met when he would go hitchhiking. And this was something whenever he told this story, my mother was right behind him saying, don't you ever do this, don't you ever do this. Uh, my dad's family in his growing up years would move between lower middle class and just flat out poor. And college was never going to be something that was a part of his future. He got a loan, got a gracious man at the church that I grew up and that he grew up at to co-sign a loan, and off to East Texas State he went, 60 miles from his home in East Dallas. Well, getting to college was one thing, but then getting to college literally, physically, was another thing. And so off he went with a backpack and a thumb and hitchhiking on to East Texas State. And he would tell me stories of the people he would meet when he would come home for Thanksgiving and Christmas, back and forth, hitchhiking he would go. You know, hitchhikers sometimes today we think of them as drifters. But a hitchhiker by definition is someone who is passing through and they have a definite direction and destination in mind of a place that they want to get. They are dependent upon the mercy of another to get there. And their entire journey is characterized by hope. Now, if you're a hitchhiker here in Oklahoma, it's even a more difficult prospect because of road signs such as these. If you go ahead and bring up that picture, maybe you've seen these. <laughs> If hitchhiking wasn't hard enough, I don't know what it is about my sixth sense of humor, but I always laugh when I pass by these. <laughs> how many in this room, let's take a quick poll, how many have ever hitchhiked? Go ahead and raise your hands. Okay, there's a few. Right now the mothers are going, don't you do that, Mitch, don't you encourage that. <laughs> hitchhiking, something we can identify with. Because we are a people that are just a passing through. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. We have a definite destination in mind. Our trip is completely dependent upon the mercy of another. It is characterized by hope. And we take the journey most accurately when we understand, church, that we are escaping inmates from sin. 
We have been set free, every last one of us that is covered in the blood and grace of Jesus Christ. And we've got our thumbs out. And we want Jesus to continue to swing low and pick us up and carry us on our way. We're hitchhikers. And for the next few weeks, if you've got your Bibles today, be turning to the book of 1 Peter. We're going to be looking at this letter that the Apostle Peter writes to churches in Asia Minor. And how he is reminding them to be hitchhikers, to be foreigners that are passing through this life different because of the destination and the one, namely, that they are headed towards. Before we get into chapter 1 and verse 1, let's go to our Father in prayer as we begin this series. Almighty God, our Father, we thank you for this time. We th- oh, Lord, we thank you for this body that we're a part of, that we're not here alone. That we take this journey as family, as friends. Friends of faith, Father, caught up in the love of Jesus Christ and what you have afforded us by his death on the cross and his resurrection. And Father, by that great mercy, Father, we're different. We're forever different. We're unique. We're peculiar. We're weird. And Father, today speak to us on how we are to live differently in this culture, in this world, so that others can live differently in this culture and world and live for you in living hope. It is in Jesus that we pray. Amen. First verse, 1 Peter, chapter 1 and verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect Exiles. There's a word that carries a whole lot of weight, especially in the Jewish mindset of being an exiled people. I write to you, God's elect exiles, scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Let's take that word exile. Some of you in your Bibles are going, Mitch, that didn't show up in my translation. Maybe it showed up as strangers, as foreigners as aliens, as refugees even in one translation. I love the simple language Bible that says, people who are at home, but yet not at home. They don't fit in anymore. Oh, they used to, but now because of the one they follow, they don't fit so nicely or at all anymore. Christians are different We as Christ followers are not supposed to fit into the culture. Hear this, church. Graced people are displaced people. Let's say that together. Graced people are displaced people. Our home, our livelihood, our power, our Lord. He lives differently and calls us to live differently. These Christ followers that Peter was writing, when they originally heard the message to be salt and light in a city on a hill, when they heard the message that everyone else is going through that wide gate, but no, not you, you go through that narrow gate. When they heard these metaphors, these illustrations, these words on being different, they took them seriously. We have saved from antiquity a letter from a Christ follower named Mathetes. He writes to Dionetus, the tutor of Marcus Aurelius in the early 2nd century. And he writes to Dionetius to describe what these Christians, this new movement, what were they all about and how they acted. And in chapter 5 of his letter, it took him several chapters. In chapter 5, he begins with this. Christians are indistinguishable from other men, either by nationality, language, or customs. They do not inhabit separate cities of their own or speak a strange dialect or follow some outlandish way of life. With regards to dress, food, and manner of life in general, they follow the customs of whatever city they happen to be living in, whether it is Greek or foreign. And yet there is something extraordinary about their lives. They live in their own countries as though they were only passing through. 
They play their full role as citizens, but labor under all the disabilities of aliens. Any country can be found their homeland, but for them their homeland, whatever it may be, is a foreign country. Like, other, like others, they marry and have children, but they do not expose them to the elements. They don't give their kids away. They share their meals, but not their beds. They live in the flesh, but they are not governed by the desires of the flesh. These Christians pass their days upon earth, but are citizens of heaven, obedient to the laws, yet they live on a level that transcends the law. Christians love all men and women, but all men persecute them anyway. Condemned because they are not understood, they are put to death, but they say they're raised to life again. They live in poverty, but enrich many. They are totally destitute, but possess an abundance of everything. They suffer dishonor, but that is their glory. They are defamed, but vindicated. A blessing is their answer to abuse. Deference, their response to insult. For the good they do, they receive the punishment of malefactors, but even then they rejoice as though they were receiving the gift of life." Christians and Christ followers, disciples of Jesus, are different fundamentally. We are a peculiar people. If you are in Austin, the bumper sticker says, keep Austin weird. Here at the park, the bumper sticker says, keep the park weird. We are to be peculiar. We are to be different. I want you right now to get this in your head. Turn to the person on each side of you and just very kindly pay them the best compliment you can this morning and let them know, say, you're a little weird. Go ahead. Okay, now some of you enjoyed that a little bit too much. And some of you on the front row didn't say a little bit. You said you're real weird. That's a better compliment. It's hard to be and stay a peculiar people. Because in each one of us is a strong, strong drive to fit in. Go to any elementary, especially any junior high middle school that is getting underway right now. You remember those days. There is a drive to fit in. Even those kids that say they don't want to fit in sit at the table with the other kids that don't want to fit in. Solomon Ash in the 1950s did a study on peer pressure, on societal pressures at Columbia University. He put eight people in a room. Seven were in on his test. There were several lines that were put on a sheet of paper, and there was one that was distinguishable from the other lines. It was very clear. Then would come in the eighth person who was not in on the test, the naive person, the one who was ignorant of what was going on. Solomon would then say to the people in the room, would you please over the next 12 pages pick out the line that is different. Each time the seven confederates, those in on the plan, would say, there's no difference. The one person who could tell there was an obvious difference one-third of the time in all 12 examples would say, I agree, there's no difference. 75% of the time, those that would finally disagree and go, come on, there's one line here that's different, would begin by saying, trying to build common ground, knowing there was a difference, would say, yeah, there's no difference here. We want to fit in. We are called by Jesus Christ and the Word of God to be a peculiar people, to be foreigners, to be weird, to be people who stand out, who are salt and light. Someone this morning might say, well, that is some unexpected outcome of the Christian walk. I guess it caught God a little bit off guard when that was something that manifested itself out of following His Son. We go back to the Word of God and we read that word that preceded the word exile, the qualifier. You are God's elect exiles. It is with great foreknowledge that He knew that you would not be drifters, simply as some wave sent here or there by the forces of society. But instead, you would take that narrow path. Instead, God knew that in following His Son, you would be people who would be even persecuted. You would be different from society. 
And in this we see people who are not just drifters but hitchhikers. A people who are going in a direction that are passing through to a definite definition, definite destination based on the mercy of God, traveling with God, where hope is on our minds as we have escaped the sin and culture into which we used to live. The Word of God next week we'll get into, it says you are born again. You have a new birth because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You are completely changed. There is nothing of you that is of the same nature that as was before. You are being formed into His likeness. And we understand in this truth that we are not just saved. Church, when we say that we are saved, that is half the truth. We are saved, but we are also, out of that salvation, sent. We are a peculiar people with a passion for where God has called us to go. Paul, the apostle, would line up with Peter, the apostle, when he would use the language of, we are ambassadors. We are representatives. We are people not simply trying to erase and suffer this difference, but embrace it. It is our core identity. If you like to fill in lines on the back of your handout in that sermon outline, number one, to embrace living hope, I must embrace my identity as an elected exile. Someone who has been called to live differently in this culture. Many Christians, when they understand their role in this society and being different, in this first picture, you see what many Christians begin to do. They begin to dig a bomb shelter. They begin to draw back. They begin to almost become some type of monastic monk and get away from the society. They flee. The society is so harmful and so different, let us get away from it. And those that don't flee, well, maybe they don't dig a bomb shelter mentality with their lives, but they concoct some type of cage match mentality in this next picture. We're not going to flee, but we're going to fight. Instead, Jesus says, by the power of the Spirit, can we continue to follow and be formed as ambassadors who take the difference of Christ to the world today. 1 Peter 1 and 2 continuing says, verse 1 to God's elect exiles, then the identity comes through. Number one, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Number two, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Number three, to be obedient to Jesus Christ. And finally, number four, those who are being sprinkled with His blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Let's take a look at each one of those when it comes to our identity. Number one, as someone who is a peculiar person for God, you have been, number one, chosen by God. That means, number one, I am selected. I am wanted by Him. It was in my time away that one day I was kind of surfing the web, and this picture has been making its rounds. I've printed it off. It now sits on my desk. Boy, this one, this one wrecked my heart in a good way. Go ahead and bring up that picture, if you will. You see in the foreground, this little lamb. And he's dirty, and he's stuck, and he's in harm's way, and he's defenseless. But in the background, someone is coming. And not just kind of. It is John 10, the good shepherd. It is Luke 15, the shepherd who has 99 that are fine, but one has gone astray. I love this picture because it says, I am chosen. I am selected. I am wanted. And this is why we don't flee or we don't fight. But Christ formed in us, we have a message to deliver. And that Christ desires for none to be lost. And in our strangeness, we're not just saved, but we're sent to deliver this message. He goes on to not only say that we're chosen by God, but this comes through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Number two, that word sanctifying... I'm not just selected, I am set apart. I am different and on a different mission because of Jesus Christ. If you bring up this next slide, I am committed to this. I will be a stranger in this world so others will not be estranged in that world. My mission is to be a stranger in this world 
So that others one day will not be estranged on the judgment day when it comes to that world which is coming. Which leads to the truth that we've already touched on, I am sent. Number three, what we read earlier, to be obedient to Jesus Christ. We're not just being obedient because God has picked these arbitrary commands that we're to fulfill so we'll be a little bit better as people, not harm each other along the way. We're to be obedient because it is a part of our ambassadorship, part of our sentness, if I can say it that way, in Jesus Christ. Let us understand this. And boy, this is, this is a sermon in and of itself. It is not so much that obedience to Christ brings a reward, though it is that. It is not so much that obedience to Christ brings a reward. Is it, it is that obedience to Christ is the reward. Did you hear that, church? It is not that I obey so that I get. It is in the obeying that I receive. That I am being formed and sent into the very likeness of Christ. And it is in that being sent, if you bring up that next one, the commitment we want to live to, we, I must feel out of place so others can find their place. It is an obedience when he says, go, I don't want to go. But we go because he says, and in that we and they find their reward. In this world, we, we speak differently. We spend our money differently. We spend our time differently. We consume media differently. When we go on a business trip, the way we conduct ourselves at the game, we act differently. The what we do is compounded by the way we do it with the joy and peace and kindness of Christ. It's not only what we do in the world, it's what we do when we gather here. Church, I am thankful that you are a body of believers that believes that the reason we are going to two assemblies starting today is we are trying to make room for others. We want other people to come here and feel this family and know the love of Christ. It is not just what we do out there, but what we also do in here. One of the most formative moments on my sabbatical. I'm headed to Oklahoma City. I'm going to uh, attend the church where my son and daughter-in-law and two granddaughters attend. I've never been there. I've got on my old jeans and a t-shirt and I've got a polo shirt in the back and I'm going to go and after church help Jake put together a playground for my two-year-old granddaughter. Big as the Taj Mahal, all right? So I'm in my work clothes, and I got my church clothes, and Shannon's back is hurting, but to be with the grandkids, she says, just give me another pain pill and let's go. So off to Edmund we go. I get her in the house. Jake and Kenzie say, she's not doing well. We're going to stay home and take care of her. I say, I really want to see your church. I say, no, no, you go, you go. It's about that time I remember that I left the nice shirt and the nice clothes back at the house. So off to church, I go on my old jeans and an old t-shirt. Well, there I go. Being Mitch Wilburn, my dad always taught me, if you're not there 30 minutes early, you're not on time. And so I show up 30 minutes early for their first service. Big, big church. But I'm so early, I'm going to catch them before they've got their game on to greet people. I pull into the parking lot. I'm by myself. Who am I to them? I've never been there before. They don't know me from... Am I a, a businessman investigating a church for my family to visit because I got a new job? Maybe not with my old Van Halen t-shirt on. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, I was going to paint in it, but uh, am I recently divorced because I'm there by myself? Am I single? Yeah, who am I? Well, I get out and here comes a guy whipping up in a golf cart. And I already know I need the steps and I'm not going to tell him when he says, do you need a ride, that I need a ride, and no, I'll be fine walking. And he yells at me with this laugh. He goes, hey, do me a favor. Come get in this golf cart so somebody here will think I'm doing my job. <laughs> well, now I'm doing him a favor. So I sit in the front seat, and off we go. Hey, I'm Slade. I'm Mitch. We get up there to the door. You ever been here before? I've never been here before. 
Boy, he stops that golf cart. He walks me up to the front door. Hey, this is Mitch. He's never been here before. You thought I was the king. They brought me on in, sat me on down. That was pretty nice. But I tell you, you go, Mitch, you said that's the most formative part of your sabbatical. Come on. What got me was, is when I came out of church and that golf cart was waiting there and Slade looked at me and he goes, I've been waiting on you. I know where you parked. Let's go. Now we're not done yet. Hey, Mitch, pretty big place, isn't it? It's a pretty big place. You from a small church? Yeah, we're pretty small. <laughs> you can get lost in that big place. I go, yeah, I can get lost. You need a small group. I need a small group. He goes, you come to mind tonight. Let me tell you something. There's a passage in the Bible that says, I was a stranger and you invited me in. Church, we got work to do. Church, and I'm not saying that out of guilt or beat down. I'm excited. I'm excited because our Lord has called us to be so different that we carry a cross. And we're about the business of being sent and being out of place so others can find their place. Let God continue to be a church. Let Him continue to make us a church that represents Him where we feel out of place so others can find their place. And here's what I love by the end of what we read earlier. Right about now someone's going, I don't always do that, Mitch. My business trips aren't always different from those I attend business trips with. My media that I consume is not always different. My language is not always different. My behavior is not always different. Last thing it said, you are called by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ as you are being sprinkled with His blood. You are being sprinkled. You are being covered. Grace has the last word in the process. Whatever we are about, Jesus is right there with us, and as He walks with us, He covers us. Grace has the last word. Say that with me. Grace has the last word. We're escaping inmates. We've been touched by His blood. And if there was ever a book... Someone says, Mitch, you've preached this whole sermon on two verses. I really could preach this whole sermon on one word. I think it's the one book in the Bible you can preach with one word. Because after everything I've said, and the Holy Spirit is trying to deliver this word, be different, stand out, our minds go to. A campfire in a courtyard. Hey, he's the one who knows him. Hey, you're the one that was with him. I wasn't with him. Yeah, it was you. He's one of his followers. No, it wasn't me. It was to you. To the point of cursing. I don't know the man. And the cock crows. And all Peter wants to do. Is fit in. And now. When grace has the last word. And the Holy Spirit says. Who's going to write my letter. On standing out and being different. The first word. Of the first chapter. And the first verse. Of first Peter is. Peter. He gets to write the letter. If you haven't been standing out, you too get to follow in those same steps of beginning that process by the sanctifying work of the Spirit today in obedience to Jesus Christ, being covered in His blood every step of the way. Church, let's stand at this time. I'm going to ask those on our prayer teams to be making their way over to this northern wall. At any point during the invitation after the service, we have a group of women, men, elders, and wives that will pray for you. If there is anything today 
where the Spirit has touched your heart, anything you have come burdened with into this room where they can pray for you, please come. If you have not made the step of being baptized into Jesus Christ and being united with the blood that covers you, don't let another day pass by. We would love to talk to you about that. Or today... In next steps, Mike Johns is ready to receive you. If there is somebody saying, hey, that Slade guy who drove a golf cart, I may not be able to go in on a mission trip. I may not be able to teach a class. I may not be able to do this or that. But you know what? I can greet people with the best of them. I can drive a golf cart across asphalt. Some of you are going to need to watch on that note. But some of you, man, sign up for that. I am so thankful for our welcome team that was here today, setting the tone of welcoming people to find their place here so they won't be strangers in this place or that place. If any of those things, would you come now as we sing together?